Hello, good morning and welcome to our latest webinar, uh, Near Me Groups with Allied Health Professionals. Um, my name is Mark Bezik, I'm the National Lead for the Near Me Networks here in Scotland. And I'm delighted that you've joined us today uh, to explore how Near Me Groups can support you in meeting the needs of people seeking help from your services. Um, I'm going to just basically get a bit of housekeeping to start with. So we're, everyone's coming on mute. I'm going to run through some accessibility options with you shortly. Um, if you're struggling to see us or hear us, then uh, see if you can get near some better Wi-Fi perhaps. Uh, sometimes connecting your device to an Ethernet cable to the network sometimes helps with that. We have a Q&A section open this morning, so we'd love to hear from you uh, in terms of where you are, what kind of work you're involved in, what kind of profession you're in. That'd be really good for us to get an understanding of uh, who's in the audience today. We're going to be recording the session today, so if people can't make or colleagues can't make it today, then they'll be able to view it later. I would also like to sh uh, share with you after the event uh, the resources that we're going to generate from the Q&A and also the recording and the slides. So we'll do that through the attendee list that the Teams captures during this, this session. So if you would not like to receive anything after the event, please message us in the Q&A. Uh, we will only see that. We publish what's in the Q&A. So if you want to let us know that you, you don't want to um, receive anything afterwards, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, any particular questions you have in the chat, please use uh, any particular comments or you know, stories or, or how you've used NEMI groups, if it's something you're using already. Basically, here you've got an image of some of the things to be able to do on this Teams Live event. So if things like uh, uh, captions or subtitles help for you, you can do that. You can also change the speed of the presentation but you can also pause it as well. So if you want to pause, then you can do that and then pick it up where you left off. So you've got a bit of flexibility in terms of what you can do with the Teams functions in there. You can also uh, pin speakers as well, but hopefully you'll be able to see it and hear us uh, all the way through. What we'd like to do before we get underway is, is just kind of sense where people are at. We've got two questions to ask you on a poll. Uh, Dawn is going to put the poll in the chat, so hopefully you can just you can click on that and go straight to the website. Or if you have another device, you can just scan the QR code that will be on your screen now, and that will just we're just going to ask you, you know, uh, what's your current knowledge of Neemi groups, and are you already using Neemi groups with patients? So hopefully you'll be able to let us know where you're at in terms of uh, your use of Neemi groups. So that'd be super. Now, we have an a, 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 a excellent lineup for you today. There's myself uh, hosting the session. I'm supported by Dawn Robb, who's my colleague from the National Near Me team. And she's going to be looking at monitoring the Q&A and, and supporting uh, people with that and also gathering questions for our, our um, session at the end. We've also got Tracy Towler from Induction Healthcare, which is the company that, that provides the software that powers Near Me part of Attend Anywhere. And again, any technical questions around the group platform, then Tracy will be supporting Dawn and I in answering those questions. Um, now, uh, also lined up, we did have uh, uh, Leslie Holdsworth here, but um, sadly she's not joined us just yet. So what we might do is we may well move Leslie uh, to, to further down the uh, the list of presenting. So, but she's, but she's supposed to be here just to give us a national picture of where NAMI Group sits within the uh, AHP workforce plan and the digital side of things. But we do have uh, um, physical therapists, dietitians, and speech language therapists sharing what they've been doing uh, with near me within their services now. So what I'm gonna do next is, I'm gonna just jump forward. So yeah, we're gonna last what we're gonna look at this morning. So we're gonna have Q&A at the end. So anything you wanna kind of chat or ask the clinicians, they'll be here at the end to answer your questions. Um, but we'll we'll maybe do the the national digital bit towards the end of the session. Um, so we're going to skip past Leslie, and then we're going to go first to um, Angela Cavallo. So Angela's going to uh, speak to you about the dietetic services and also uh, Dervla Burn too. But Angela's going to come up first. So I'll just let Angela take the stage, and I can move the slides on for her. Thank you, Angela. 
Hello, thank you there. Um, so as Mark said, I'm Angela Cavallo um, and I'm joined by my colleague Dev LeBurn. Um, and we're both dietitians from the NHS Lothian Weight Management Service. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about our service and our experience with using the NIMI platform so far. Um, so to start, we thought it might be useful to provide a brief summary of what we do within our service. Um, so we are a dietetic led multidisciplinary specialist service for diet, health and weight um, with a focus on type 2 diabetes prevention and remission also. Um, we have a number of work streams within our service, such as our weight management programs for both children and adults, our weight management psychology service, which focuses on relationship with food, our gestational diabetes and type 2 diabetes remission programs, um, our education programs on type 2 diabetes, um, which is Desmond, and type 2 diabetes prevention, which is Let's Prevent Diabetes. Um, and we also ha have our new fertility service uh, to support those hoping to access fertility treatment. Um, so as you can see, we are a big service with a lot of different programmes, um, and these programmes are predominantly delivered in a group setting. Uh, we do carry out individual one to one assessments. However, the interventions tend to be education based groups. Um, now, pre COVID, these groups and one to one clinics would have always been face to face in local community clinics or venues. Um, therefore, when lockdown happened in March 2020, we had to temporarily pause our services as we were unable to facilitate our groups and clinics face to face. This then meant that our already fairly long waiting lists were even more under pressure. Um, so this is then really when we started to look for virtual options. Uh, so the next slide. Thank you. Um, so in May 2020, we started to get the ball rolling with using Near Me for our one to one appointments. Um, and this is eventually when we went live in June 2020. Um, initially, we started with our paediatric one to one clinics and then soon after we rolled out to our adult one to one clinics also. Uh, so this meant that we were back up and running to be able to assess the patients on our growing waiting lists. Um, we then started remobilizing some of our other work streams um, and set them up straight away with near me for the one to one um, appointments. Um, in terms of groups, as the near me group platform wasn't up and running just yet, we were initially using another digital platform. However, um, when we remobilized our gestational diabetes program, they actually started using uh, the NIMI one to one clinic platform to facilitate small groups of patients by adding them all to the same call, um, which worked really well for them. Um, however, when NIMI groups launched, our plan was always to gradually move all of our groups over um, because we were becoming so accustomed to the functionality of the one to one NIMI clinics. Uh, therefore, in December 2021, we began the switch over to NIMI groups um, for two of our programmes to start off with our tier two weight management group programme and our weight management maintenance groups. Um, so next slide. So that brings me on to now. Obviously, since then, we have been able to get back to seeing patients face to face. Um, however, we've continued to offer virtual options for groups and clinics via NIMI as more of a blended approach because we realise that it's been really useful for some of our patients, um, which Dervila will expand on. Um, we continue to use NIMI in all of our one to one clinics for all work streams. Um, we've decided to revert, revert back to face to face for our tier two weight management group to enable a mixed model of provision. Um, however, we do continue to use it for our weight management maintenance groups. Um, and we now also use it for our gestational diabetes, type two diabetes remission, Desmond, um, LPD and fertility groups. Um, and our disordered eating group Eat Think Change is due to start on near me soon also. Um, so that's been our story so far with near me. I'm now going to pass it over to Dervila to talk about the benefits and challenges we've experienced and our plans for the future. Thanks Angela. So I'm going to take over now and start off by talking you through some of the main benefits that using near me has brought to our service um, as a whole. And Mark, if you could just go to the next slide. Great, thank you. So firstly, the establishment of Near Me in June 2020 opened up access to our service during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
During this time, we were unable to meet with our patients in a face-to-face -face setting, and Near Me provided us with a gateway to remobilize our service and resume our clinical interactions with patients. As our appointments can now take place virtually, there is reduced exposure to COVID-19. Patients now have the option of attending their appointments from the comfort of their own home, and this has been particularly beneficial for those with underlying health conditions who are shielding in terms of minimising any potential risk to them. Near Me enables us to reach a wider patient demographic, so essentially we can now reach those patients who may have struggled to engage with our service. These uh, groups of patients include those with restricted mobility or those who are perhaps housebound, those living in remote or isolated areas, or those who experience social anxiety. Lastly, being on holidays is no longer an excuse for not attending appointments, as patients can now log on remotely using a smartphone or tablet device. Near Me provides a faster and more efficient form of care delivery. There is no longer any need for patients to, to commute to and from a health centre, which can be time consuming. Parking may also be scarce in some of our community venues, which may act as a further deterrent. There is increased scope for flexibility, so we as a service can generally be more flexible with the days and times that we can offer patients appointments. We are no longer restricted by clinic space availability or time allocations available. Near Me platforms um, are user friendly and they are routinely being upgraded and improved. So patients receive clear instructions on how to access the platform. They are encouraged to actively participate in group sessions and ask questions. There is a chat function and a raise hand function for this purpose. There is also the option for the clinician to share educational content, send links and play videos. And lastly, reduced carbon footprint. It's worth mentioning as well that as a service, we can play an active role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as we can now see patients and deliver health interventions on a centralised digital platform. So you can see from these benefits, it's very clear the establishment of Near Me has really been a game changer in enhancing the overall standard and flexibility of care that we offer to our patients. But we also wanted to briefly touch on some of the challenges as well that Near Me has posed. The next slide. So first of all, with Near Me, we are unable to take anthropometry, and this is something that we would normally do in face-to-face -face clinics, for example, taking a patient's weight and height. So with Near Me, we have to rely on self-reported measurements. Digital poverty may pose an issue, so using the Near Me platform requires the service user to have a compatible digital advice, for example, a smartphone, a tablet or a laptop computer. We acknowledge that not everyone has access to these and generational differences may pose an issue. Initial functionality issues. So when the platform was first launched, there was initially no chat function and we were unable to see patients' full names. Thankfully, all of these teething issues have been addressed and the Near Me team were very responsive to our requests. Periodic functionality issues may occur due to poor or disrupted internet connection, such as delayed sound, echoing and freezing, etc. So strong and secure Wi-Fi connection really is essential. More impersonal than face-to-face -face interaction, and this is something that we have received from patient feedback in our groups, that some patients have felt less inclined to speak up in a digital space or found it more challenging to build rapport with others in the group. We do try our best, however, to overcome this by encouraging discussion, asking questions and trying to make our sessions as interactive as we possibly can. No guaranteed access to a secure confidential space. So we do urge our patients to be in a private space. However, we can't definitely ensure that patients are obliging to this or have the capacity to do so. So next slide. As a service, we are continually asking our patients how they are finding Near Me and for any feedback they have, and we have collated some of this feedback to share with you today. So some of our client patient testimonials are as follows. I could not have committed to the time necessary had there not been a virtual option. 
This group alleviated my anxiety for travel and meeting people in person. This was easier to fit around my working hours. Being at home meant I didn't need to worry about parking, travel or arriving late. Very helpful as I am not a car driver and it would have been two buses for me to get to the hospital and very happy to be online and to do something to lower my carbon footprint. So next slide. Now, just to finish up on future plans going forward. So we do plan to move all of our virtual groups to near me as it is the digital platform of preference. And we will, in the meantime, continue to liaise with the Near Me team to discuss further beneficial functions going forward. And thank you. That brings it to the end of our presentation. That's great. Thank you, uh, Dervla and Angela. That's really nice. Get a, get a real journey you've been on and it's really clearly presented. Thank you so much. And again, some great patient stories there and how person centred um, you've been. So that's that's fab to hear that. So what we're going to do next is uh, we're going to look at a quick video. So we have um, Annabelle Cahoon. She's a, spe a speech language therapist from NHS Lothian. And I'm going to just queue up her video. So bear with me just a second. And then we can get Angela and not me and I'm going to just press play and hopefully this Um, hello everyone, um, so as Mark said, I'm a community therapist working out in East Lothian and Mark asked me just to do a bit of uh, talk with you guys about my experience of using Near Me. Um, next slide please, Mark. OK. So um, as Mark said, um, NHS Lothian, uh, the SLT um, group of us were the very early adopters of um, near me. Um, personally, I found it a really useful thing because I was uh, in the shielding category for um, four months in 2020 and five months in 2021. So near me allowed me to participate in sort of general um, assessment and therapy and alongside my colleagues who are in the office. So I've, I've used a lot of near me um, over the last couple of years. Um, so in terms of groups, uh, I'm going to talk about two groups I've worked on recently. Um, the first group was with my colleague Ursula Duff. Um, we decided to do a trial with people with aphasia as part of a student placement. Um, we'd been talking in the office about how opportunities for students was, were really reduced as a result of COVID. They weren't really getting exposure to, to patients that they were used to. Um, we also felt that normal social groups that uh, our patients would have attended, such as the chest, heart and stroke groups or befriending opportunities, just weren't really running. Um, so what we felt was that this was an opportunity to sort of combine the two together. We set up four hour long sessions with two students and two patients with aphasia and then either Ursula or I attended the group as well. It was all done by a near me. Um, the students had to prepare and lead each session and they had each met one of the patients separately and in, in advance and talked about what the patient's goals uh, and reasons for being involved in the group were. For both patients, it was an opportunity to meet someone else who had had a stroke um, and also had communication difficulties. Uh, it was also an opportunity to practice computer skills, um, such as typing, using a mouse, um, setting up a camera, and, and also an opportunity to continue participation in communication tasks. Both these patients were active with us prior to coming to the NIMI group anyway. Also, it allowed them an opportunity to practice doing some online stuff before attending something like the chest heart and stroke online group so there was that sort of option as well it was kind of a safe place to, to try out some online opportunities for the students it was an opportunity to run a group which wouldn't have been possible in covid um, it was an opportunity to think about therapy tasks uh, how to manage conversation with four different people with communication different communication abilities and how to solve technical um, difficulties as well. 
The second group we ran was more of a social group that was between two therapists and myself and Izzy Williams, and then two people with communication difficulties post-stroke, aphasia and apraxia. Um, I've been working with my patient for a number of months and he really wanted the opportunity to, to meet with other people who had had uh, strokes and had communication impairments but hadn't been able to because of COVID. He's relatively young and I don't know if he would have been someone that would have attended the chest time stroke groups anyway. So um, this was a kind of far more informal group. We basically um, introduced our respective patients to each other. Both of them were active, both Izzy and I, and then left them to talk to and get to know each other for about 40 minutes. And then we came back in. We met with the uh, patients afterwards and, and said, would you like to meet again? They're very keen to meet again. Um, so they're going to meet again in near me, but then hopefully after that, they're actually going to meet in person. So that's kind of something that's kind of growing um, as well. And um, next slide, please, Mark. So Mark asked me to talk about the barriers and solutions uh, to, to using near me. Um, I thought there were four sort of main barriers and you'll all be really aware of these. Firstly, internet connection. Uh, it, it's the bugbear really. Um, we had one session where a the person with aphasia dropped out of the session uh, sort of every five to ten minutes um, and it's very little you can do as the, the person the therapist in the hospital what you know what you can do so I think it was handy that he had someone nearby that could actually help reconnect him to near me because actually near me is slightly difficult to use if you have difficulties spelling your name uh, putting in your date of birth typing you know just moving around the keyboard so that was the kind of solution to that other barriers I think are just general technical issues. Um, things like a time lag can be really difficult when someone has a communication impairment because sometimes it's difficult to interpret if that person is speaking slowly or if they're taking longer to process information. So it's just, you know, the, the, the solutions to that are sort of education about, about time lag and how it works. Um, we also had lots of situations where people's cameras were sort of off to the side or you looked at their nose or whatever. So it's just uh, making people be aware that, that that camera in the bottom there, that's where you can see yourself. So making people aware of that sort of thing. Um, the third barrier is that I think people with aphasia have communication impairments in the first place. And actually they use lots of different tools in addition to speech to communicate. And these aren't always an option in uh, a near me situation. So they might use writing, they might use drawing, they might use gesturing, uh, they might use pointing, for instance. What we really encouraged was the use of the chat function, um, which I think is a fabulous feature in, in near me. We also, um, in the student group, we asked people to um, share screens so that they could look at different sort of visual materials as well. Um, so it's just trying to make speech as sort of multimodal as, as possible, communication as multimodal as possible. I think the fourth and final barrier, I think, is patient enthusiasm. Ursula and I have spoken about other patients that we thought might be keen, but when we asked them, they were like, oh, absolutely not, absolutely not. Um, and so I think it's really important to think about which patients are appropriate to, to be members of the group. Um, and to choose them carefully as we as clinicians have far less control over, you know, if a patient is very dominant uh, in a session, it's very difficult to control that situation if you're not in the same room as them. And next slide, please, Mark. Uh, the impact on our service, I think, is really positive, actually. Um, in terms of student placements, I think it offered them a sort of really a, a lot greater range of opportunities. Um, and, and allowed students to really sort of think outside of the box. It also gave students an opportunity to meet with patients without masks on, which are really detrimental to speech and language therapy uh, communication opportunities. So I, I think that was really positive. I also thought it provided social opportunities for patients that were really lacking um, sort of during COVID and really still haven't restarted post COVID. So I think there was that sort of social opportunity that it offered. Um, reduced travel time is phenomenal. Um, as a community therapist, I put aside 30 to 60 minutes for every patient um, that I go and see in terms of travel time, so to and from. So that really reduced our travel time um, as well and allows us to see patients in a more timely manner. You know, you can offer a few, you know, therapy sessions online a week, you know, versus one face to face. 
Um, and I also think that Near Me really offers different options for our patients. You know, we don't have to do everything face to face. There are lots of different ways that we can actually deliver therapy and, and deliver our sessions. So I think it's a very positive thing. Um, uh, last slide, please. So Mark asked me to talk about what we would do differently. Um, and there are a few things. I think if we were going to do it again, um, we might try larger groups. We deliberately started with a smaller group because we didn't weren't really sure how it was going to work. But I think having you know increased confidence with how the, the group went, we would we'd try larger groups. I don't think we would try any more than three or four patients in a group. Um, but I think up to three or four might be might be quite good. It would allow for more variety of discussion. Um, I think if you had larger than the groups than this, the communication impairments would because everyone's communication impairment is different. I think it, there will be too much variety in a group. Um, but I don't think that's specific to near me. I think that's actually part of you know group doing groups with people with communication difficulties actually. Um, and I think it remains really important to choose people that are a similar level um, when, when you're doing a group in terms of their communication difficulty. I was also thinking that maybe having a topic each week might have made, made it easier to start sessions off. Um, the students organised them, organised the sessions in terms of tasks, but I wondered if more a topic focused thing would be more realistic for a patient, less, less intimidating for a patient. So today we're going to talk about next week, we're going to talk about holidays. Have to think about some holidays you liked, whatever. Um, that might be quite specific to our client client group, though. Um, I think another thing that we might do differently is have slightly longer sessions. So we'd scheduled hour long sessions, and because we use a clinic room that's used by other people, we'd only kind of set aside an hour. But I wonder if having a, maybe a ninety minute session might have been better for our particular sort of client group because it allows time for people to communicates more freely and allows time for sort of technical difficulties as well. I think as well, having done the groups, I would really emphasize the use of visual support. So screen sharing and, you know, possibly using videos, using the chat function far more. I think that would be really useful. Um, and finally, I think what we would do differently is trying to encourage other speech and language therapists uh, to, to have a shot at this. Um, We've spoken about doing other groups. Um, so normally in normal pre-COVID times, we run Parkinson's groups and aphasia groups and voice groups. And I, I think a lot of people haven't really done groups, but I think there's lots of opportunities to, to make use of this um, facility. I, I think Naomi's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, that's the end of my talk. Um, sorry, I'm not there in person, uh, but thank you very much for listening. OK, uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, Annabelle, in her absence. Uh, again, really good to hear their kind of journey. And interestingly around, you know, I'm not, not making assumptions about which patients should or shouldn't come uh, and, and it's very much around choice. And again, the, the, the really key thing around, you know, having a session with somebody for speech and language therapy without having a mask on. I think that'd be really, uh, that's a key thing, I think, to take away uh, for um, what's happened there. Hang on a sec, sorry. There we go, hopefully that's come back now. Yes, uh, and, and again, the impact on travel as well. I think that's a really thing we've not really talked about the impact on health and well-being of, and travel related to clinicians uh, moving around the countryside at pace at times, trying to get around people's appointments. So anyway, without further ado, I'm going to now hand over to um, uh, Kathy Gillen and Sarah Nolan, and they're going to talk about how they've used uh, video to support their uh, respiratory patients in the Republic of Ireland. So I'm going to just queue up uh, back onto the slides. Now we've just finished sharing. There we go. And there's there's Sarah and Kathy. We're very delighted to see you this morning. Let me just. Uh, bear with me. Make sure we get the right. There we go. Okay, over to you. Thanks very much.
Perfect. Um, so my name is Sarah Nolan um, and this is Cathy and um, Cathy Gillen. We're both clinical specialist physiotherapists here in Our Lady of Lords Hospital in Drogheda. So I work in COPD outreach and Cathy works in respiratory physiotherapy. And um, so we just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our virtual and um, pulmonary rehab classes that were set up back in 2019. And um, so next slide, please, Mark, if you don't mind. Um, so just a little bit of background um, our hospital is in County Louth in Ireland um, and it covers a catchment area of about 100,000 people. Um, next slide, please. Um, in terms of um, virtual pulmonary rehabilitation, so um, our project here in Our Lady of Lords was the first of its kind nationally in Ireland. Um, and the objective was to kind of use um, digital technology to allow us to deliver um, a home based exercise program um, and that it had clinically significant improvements for our patients who were over 65 and had COPD. And um, so then just in terms of the project timeline, um, I think if you hear it, hit the next slide or next button, it might pop up. Yeah, there we go. Um, so initially, Cathy and um, our colleague Magella had a meeting with um, Empower to secure funding to help to run the project. And they worked really hard for the first few months um, to get the class live um, in October of 2019. Um, and thankfully, the girls had run two courses of um, pulmonary rehab before COVID hit. So it meant then that when COVID hit in March of 2020, that Magella was actually pregnant at the time and she was able to run the classes fully remotely from her house. And um, so we were able to keep the service alive. Um, and then Cathy and Magella were involved in the national guidelines um, for setting up pulmonary virtual pulmonary re rehabilitation back in October 2020 in line with our national clinical program. And um, so here we are kind of three years on and um, next slide please. So we have completed 15 programs of um, virtual pulmonary rehabilitation with 91 patients and um, completing the course so far. So it's been rolled out now that it's um, not just COPD patients we're taking, but also um, any type of respiratory condition. Um, and so the travel savings, I know Mark was just speaking about that there. So the travel savings there are actually based on the first 13 programmes. Um, and then in terms of age, I know it says as far as 87, but we actually had a 94 year old gentleman who just finished the course on Monday. Um, and so we've had people from all over the country um, logging in but also people if they were uh, we've had people joining from Spain or Portugal when they're on their holidays they can still log in and do their class which is great and um, next slide please um, so I suppose where did it all come from? Um, the NHS had done a survey um, back in 2015 looking at um, pulmonary rehabilitation and they found that for every 100 patients that were referred, only 42 patients completed the programme. And one of the main barriers to that was access to transport or the cost of travel and to being, being able to attend the classes. So um, obviously we were looking at what else can we do instead and um, the fact that we we had the availability of funding from Empower to um, get the digital um, technology up and running. It was obviously in line with our healthcare strategy. So the HSE is the equivalent of the NHS here in Ireland. Um, and one of the main um, kind of um, visions or um, projects for it is Slauncha Care, which basically talks about the idea that you're giving the patient the right care in the right place at the right time by the right person. And where better to give someone care but in their own home? Um, and then obviously just being a little bit aware of um, our carbon footprint. So uh, hopefully we're all living <clears throat> in a society that's trying to make us a little bit more environmentally aware. So just bearing that in mind as well. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so just a little bit about what the patient needs. So the first thing they need is um, a, a device, so a laptop or a tablet. Um, the next thing, I think, Mark, if you hit the next button, they might pop up for us. And um, yeah, there you go. The next one they need is access to Wi-Fi and um, they need an email address. They need um, some weights and um, so sorry, yeah, safe space to exercise first. So um, somewhere in their house, they can exercise some hand weights so they don't need to go out and buy them. They can use tins of beans or bottles of water. And then last thing is just some water for themselves to hydrate as well. And um, in terms of what we needed as clinicians and um, so next slide, please. Um, and again, I think they'll pop up. 
Um, so we need some type of device, so a laptop or a tablet. Um, we also needed um, um, access to Wi-Fi. Um, we needed a small gym space that we could um, run our classes out of, that a wall mounted TV or screen so that you're able to see your patients, um, a, a headset and a webcam, um, and a mobile phone in case you have any issues in relation to your patients, um, so that you're able to make contact with them and obviously a platform to run it from. So we run ours on a platform called Salasso, and um, we had originally been on Attend Anywhere, but we moved to Salasso and Cathy will talk about that in a little bit. Um, so next slide, please, Mark. Um, in terms of risk management, so when we started out doing the classes, we were obviously we were doing the assessments fully remotely. And so we were using what's called the ABC scale, which is an activity specific balance confidence scale. And basically that just gives you an idea as to how confident you are that a patient is not going to lose their balance in a certain situation. Um, and they get a score out of 100%. Um, and anybody who has a score of less than 67%, we would tell those patients that they need to have a carer or um, a family member present in the room when they're doing the classes, just if they're a falls risk. Um, we'd also do some education about the board breathlessness and using that in terms of um, managing their breathlessness during the class. And now that we're back to in-person assessments, we also do a bird balance scale with these patients, just again, further assessing their balance. Um, in terms of trying to manage our risks, so going through a home safety checklist with our patients, we get them to sign a disclaimer saying that they're accepting responsibility for exercising in their house and also that they, if they've been advised to have somebody in the room with them that they will um, um, have somebody present for each class. Um, and then obviously just in terms of emergencies, we have a next of kin contact number, we have their address and their air code, which is the Irish version of the postcode. And um, we also send them out a copy of the exercises that they're going to complete. And we have a record of their SPO2 if we need to. So I'm just going to hand you over to Cathy to continue on. Uh, next slide, Mark, thank you. Um, so hi, um, my name's Cathy. So throughout the you know, running the virtual classes, we did these PDSA cycles, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and they are very useful, um, especially if you're starting out to run your virtual classes. And obviously we did many of these uh, over the last three years because things have uh, changed. Um, so for example, in our PDSA, sorry, I'll just stay on that side for just one more second. Um, we looked at our waiting list and we had very strict inclusion and exclusion criteria. Thanks, Mark. And then you know, making sure we had the right uh, IT support. Uh, we went ahead and ran our classes. So this is maybe the PDSA, the first cycle. So this is going back, it seems a long time, it's three years ago now. So we ran our classes, as we said, we'd used Attend Anywhere platform at that time, and they had five participants per class. Um, so then when we, we ran our first seven week program, we reflected on that. Now we were getting our clinical improvements, which were comparable to a face-to-face -face class, which was great. But some of the issues, we didn't have our online ed education. We felt that we could only offer to five participants at a time. Um, and then obviously with COVID, uh, the patients couldn't come in for their pre-assessment. So some of the things we did, as Sarah said, we changed the platform to Salasso. It's just, it's it's a Kerry or an Irish based company. And um, obviously you have, you're using Near Me, um, which is great. And um, we also changed some of our outcome measures. So you do have to adapt things, um, but we opened it up to all age groups and we uploaded the MDT education videos. And that's a massive part because it means that the virtual class is is comparable to the face to face. So they're getting their exercise and they're also access to their education. And in fact, they can access those education videos at any time. And I think that's really important because rather than just hearing it once, they, they can access it many times. So next slide, please. So I think we're just moving on to the results. Um, and as clinicians, I guess we're always very, uh, we want to know that we've changed things a bit, but are the patients still benefiting? And we have found that they are. So you will be using different outcome measures. Um, for example, we're using the CAT score, and we also use the EQ5D5L, and then our exercise capacity, we're using the one minute sit stand, or we've actually gone back to the shuttle walk. So in a nutshell, we are getting comparable outcomes for 
when you compare the face to face to the virtual care. Now, I know we haven't done a randomized controlled trial on that, but I, I'm sure this is all coming down the line with virtual care. Um, but, you know, at the minute we're finding that the patients are getting those improvements. We also run a blended model now, which I think is a nice way of doing it. We do the pre and post assessments face to face so we can have this shuttle walk test done. Then the patients at home for the seven week program and then we uh, carry out their shuttle walk test after it. And I think this will be very useful when they do go to RCTs and um, rather than com comparing with the one minute set to stand, you're comparing the shuttle walk test in a face to face and a virtual class. Again, the we always give the patients an anonymous satisfaction survey. And as you can see, it's very positive, their feedback. And, that, and that's the most important thing. You know, they're talking about they'd like to continue the exercises. You're teaching them how to exercise at home with minimal equipment so they can continue that through those sort of positive changes. Sometimes all the fancy equipment, I suppose, you have in the, the gym, they're not going to have that at home. But if you can teach them to exercise safely at home, they may continue it better. And next slide, please. This is just really, I mean, I suppose with technology, um, there's always tech gremlins. Uh, so I'm talking about things that are like Wi-Fi issues, especially in rural parts of the country. Um, but, you know, if you have a second uh, clinician with you, you know, bring in the patients just to talk them through maybe what they're to talk through to get onto the call. You find patients pick it up very quickly and they usually have their curves with them. But also we did encounter things like you can get drop um, or the screen freezing or audio. No different from any of us doing these kind of presentations. You know, it is the same. You do get these tech remnants, but you get more competent with dealing with them and they become less and less and less as the time goes on. And regarding digital literacy, I suppose, you know, the patients are getting some education around using an email and we try to make, you know, the functionality very simple. It's only like two clicks of a button and they're on. Um, and I think I suppose it's important not to be um, maybe ageist for want of a better word, because we have a gentleman on, he's in his 90s. We've had patients in their 80s and, and, and people can be great. It doesn't really, age shouldn't be a barrier. You want everyone uh, to benefit. So next slide, please. So some of the learnings now, I know it's a, near me have it, uh, the group uh, classes started up. Um, we found, you know, when we were using our virtual program for group exercising, it has to be in line with the, the organisational vision. The, we were very particular in what functionality or requirements we wanted from the platform. You know, issues around uh, data hosting security and um, all these issues. It's also great if the systems can be integrated. I think we're a wee bit away from in Ireland, but you know that would be the hope that all our systems are integrated and maybe the NHS might be a bit ahead of us in that. Uh, also having access to technical support because it can be stress for clinicians. So knowing who you can ring if you are having issues. Also the ease of use of the platform, not only for the clinicians, but for the patients. And I think it's important to just keep reflecting on what you're doing. Does, does anything need changed? And finally, we just a couple of last things. Um, just to bear in mind, like it is an up and down curve. So we all are in the same boat. I suppose we're clinicians and technology. You know, we don't get loads of training in college at it. And some of us are a long time out of college. I'm talking about myself there. Um, we're kind of you're starting a project, you can be very enthusiastic and then you run into trouble with the IT or the Wi-Fi and you do lose a bit of momentum. So it's just, you know, to keep at it, keep talking to the right people. There's loads of resources out there. It's not like three years ago. There's a lot of know-how. Uh, and again, when you get the positive patient feedback and the good clinical outcomes, you do get more confident. And it's just what you're offering now, patients a choice. And um, so a lot of patients say, look, I want to be at home because it's too inconvenient for me to travel and look for parking. Um, so it's, you know, when they're getting the benefits and enjoying it more. Um, so that's the important thing that you're offering your patients a choice as well. So I suppose finally then um, patient feedback has been very positive and, uh, you know, it's the, it's the inconvenience and these patients are very breathless and it's, it can be quite stressful. So we, we just are continually finding that the patients are like, I love that I don't have to travel into the hospital twice a week for seven weeks. Like a couple of people say I've said things like, oh, I prefer the gym or the face to face classes. And they're saying things like they like the fancy equipment. But, you know, the majority of patients are really enjoying uh, staying at home to do it. 
this was the first in Ireland. I suppose this next slide shows uh, we're kind of proud of that in Drogheda because um, we did it pre-COVID. Uh, and I, I think it's, it would be a bit of a push to say it was first internationally, but certainly these are some of the places that have been in touch with us, uh, just want to know how we set it up and how it's going. So that's been great because um, it is just a regional hospital uh, outside Dublin. And finally, I think it is important to say it's better to do something imperfectly than to do nothing at perfectly. I think sometimes, you know, this rush, this, you know, to have everything perfect, but it does get easier and it does get better. And as I say, it's better to give the patient some opportunity to exercise. COVID was this massive thing and we don't know what's coming down the line. So this is definitely an option where the service isn't disrupted. There is a video just, I don't know if it'll play of me running the class. I don't know if it'll play there, Mark, but it doesn't. It's just basically me showing, doing a little bit of it. I'll try and play it. It should. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time, so I might yeah, not play no, all of it. Is I mean, that OK? It's, it's really no, yes, and this, that's that's fine. <laughs> um, but that's really it. So um, thank you for the, the opportunity to present. Um, so you can see the, the patients on the screen and um, you just need a small space. So it's, it's very straightforward when you get going. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Mark. That's great. I think that gives that that general flavour of that. So that's a super account. Thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. That's quite inspirational. And, and I think it's challenged our assumptions about the, the age of people that can engage with this technology with a bit of support uh, and, uh, and how you, you integrated quality improvement methodology to, to, to guide that project is really important. And the fantastic outcome, not just clinical, but the patient satisfaction as well. And that, those are things that are really important to, I think, to clinicians as well about is this going to be as good as doing how we used to do it before. So thank you very much. So I'm conscious of time. I'm delighted to say that Leslie's here with us now, Leslie Holdsworth. So I'm going to hand over to Leslie just to, I suppose, you know, put this into context in terms of where things are in Scotland. So um, over to you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm very sorry that um, I wasn't able to speak. I was here, I've been listening intently. There's some really fantastic experiences that have been shared here. So thank you very much. Um, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm a digital lead uh, at the government. Um, I'm actually a physiotherapist by background, um, but I, I must admit I haven't touched a patient in many a year. So I'm absolutely thrilled to, to see all the uh, activity that's going on uh, within all the, um, the allied health professions. I think what struck me about uh, this, um, the, the, if you like, the topic that we're talking about now, it is slightly different. Um, we've been through the pandemic. We know um, what, how that disrupted everything, how that was challenging for us all in many, many ways. And really the, the saviour that technology was for us to deliver ser services as usual, etc. And we were very lucky in Scotland because um, we had, did have Near Me and Near Me was deployed very quickly um, throughout all the services throughout the whole country. And I think uh, Mark can correct me. I think the, the highest level of uh, consultations was around the 28,000 um, mark. It might even be more than that. Um, but um, per, that's per consultations per week, which went from 300 in February to 2020. So you can see the massive change there. But one of our struggles, and, and I'm so delighted that, that we're here today discussing this, is that right from the beginning, people said to me, well, NHS near me is great, but we'd like to use it for groups. And it didn't have that 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 functionality at the beginning, and we were trying everything we could, and it took it took us eighteen months to be able to um, be able to offer that out, if you like, throughout the country. Um, and I honestly, I won't tell you how many hours I spent on different options trying to secure the facility that we could deliver services uh, for groups of patients. So if we think about, I cover all professions, but if we just even think about the allied health professions and and uh, the the numbers, I mean, we did a back of the fag packet thing right at the beginning, and we were thinking there must be 250,000 patients a week who could have benefited by having access to group services 
um, rather than um, just the, fa the individual ones. And they, they were they were not getting any services at once at one stage. Well, thankfully, we're in a very different position now. Um, there's far more services that are in person, but we need to we need to really take the best of the learning. And that's um, when we refresh the national strategy. That was what it was based on because we'd learned so much in a year. Everything was outdated and we had to uh, really rethink our, our direction and and actually having far more virtual and remote services, patient choice. I mean, um, all Kathy, Sarah, Angela, Annabelle, Dervla, that, that's one of the key things that they've highlighted this morning is about patient choice um, and uh, having that ability to see more patients. And I know for a fact because we actually um, there were some uh, going back to 2017 uh, in Scotland, there were cardiac rehab classes that were um, being undertaken by NHS Lothian virtually. Um, and uh, I always remember them uh, giving a presentation and other services were a bit sceptical about whether they would join um, uh, in, in this approach. But the key learning from that was, uh, and I think it's our Irish uh, colleagues here who highlighted the size of the problem for me is about to offer virtual class is we, we're not even even before the pandemic, we were not being able to um, uh, give the choice to uh, everybody who needed it. And, and having remote services is actually um, enhances that ability to do that. So absolutely wonder. So I'm, I'm thrilled to see that these groups are starting up and running. And there are so many aspects of the therapies that they could um, well uh, apply to. I suppose the, the other issues that everybody's highlighted are the same benefits that we, we see when we're giving one-to-one um, uh, -one, uh, remote um, sessions, but travel uh, uh, is, is a massive issue, not only just for the net zero um, uh, agenda, but also the efficiency of the service provider. We can see far more people um, if we uh, approach this uh, in, in, in this kind of way. Uh, and it's a saving on our time, it's a saving on our patients time um, but you know then then there is the other issue as well about the efficiency within the the services so we get far more value but also I I've often challenged some of service managers since the pandemic to say how much have you saved in la in, in, lo in um, travel uh, staff travel expenses you know if we think about that uh, on its own that we can reinvest into our services so just delighted to hear of all these experiences and would encourage as many um, people as we can to think about how they can deliver their services differently. Uh, um, we've all got our backs against the wall at the moment. We've got a massive backlog to get through, let alone the the the, the current workload. And this is just another tool in our in our in our armory, uh, and we should be really looking at that. Uh, um, and interestingly, I'll stop talking in a second. I'm part of a, an international group that um, is uh, developing uh, developing guidance around the whole use of technology and it's and it's um, done on, on in a very sort of uh, um, very robust way uh, etc and the evidence is overwhelming and so I don't think anybody needs to worry about that I think more of it is about uh, services being open and the, having the culture and the and the desire to actually get on and deliver those. So well done to all of you that have actually done that, and and I hope that you inspire uh, many others to think about how we can we can uh, offer more services to more people because that at the end of the day is what we need to do. So I'm going to stop talking now because there might be some uh, interesting questions. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Leslie, for that that uh, kind of rousing call to action, but also a really lovely summary of what we've been listening to and and here and, and looking at today. So I'm I'm conscious we've got a bit of time left. We would probably I'm going to just um, have a chat with Dawn now to find out what what are the themes from the Q and A been before I run a short poll at the end just to find out how how it's gone for you today. So um, as is there a particular uh, theme or something we want to pick up in within the chat, Dawn? And if there's themes that we can't cover. We'll collate all the questions that we haven't answered and we'll put out a resource pack for you afterwards. So sorry, carry really? on, Dawn. <clears throat> no, absolutely. There was a few questions um, mainly for those who have been running the sessions, uh, such as an evaluation of patient experience. How many patients are you actually having maximum in a group consultant? 
a wait in area as well running these sessions and if there's any post call virtual follow up. So I don't know who wants to answer that. Um, so I'll leave it over to you. Well, I thought um, I thought it was very interesting. I think it was Annabelle was talking about um, I'll just stick my oar in and then um, invite uh, somebody else to respond to this. But I thought Annabelle's point was very well made but with her particular client group with, within speech and language therapy that she felt that I think she said four patients, four to five is 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 the maximum she would want the the, the those with aphasia because of their particular issues. But I do know that in um, in some of the the services, and in fact in our, in our national digital leadership program, we have six people who are running um, uh, uh, near me groups, um, and I was talking to them this week actually, um, and some of them had um, 17, 18 in in at any one time. And I think it depends on what the topic area is, what the purpose is, um, for example, or how much individual interaction you want. So I don't know if Dervla and Angela, how many how many patients would be, you know, how, how, how what's your optimum? Yeah, so in our, we run um, weight management groups. So previously, I think we kind of capped the capacity at about 18 attendees per group. So we had obviously the clinician, the dietitian, and about 18 um, attendees. We did scale that back a little bit to a maximum of 15, just, you know, to allow for that little bit more of interaction and engagement. Um, and sometimes as well in our groups, we do also have patients requiring interpreters. So, for example, um, the interpreter might um, be in interpreting kind of over the phone to the patient listening to our delivery and that's kind of mi minimising disruption as opposed to a face to face setting. So we think that that's an another advantage, I suppose, of using the near me groups. But um, I'm sure kind of a lot of our colleagues can agree that our groups do tend to function very well with kind of um, that 15, the capacity of about up to 15 people. And and our colleagues from Ireland, how many do you have in your rehab classes? They're just saying, um, so we have eight in our classes um, and then the the one clinician, that's the max that we have. But I don't know in terms of, we, we weren't sure in terms of attend anywhere, how many or near me, sorry, how many you could have. So you can obviously have more than that, but it'd be similar in terms of our face to face classes. We would have eight patients and two clinicians normally running the class. Um, so it's eight and one clinician. And I think the nature of that with the exercise, I think eight is yeah. plenty, you know, by being able to see them on the screen, um, but you can run it with eight and it is comparable again to face to face. And and I quite understand what you were saying, what you were saying about um, the numbers, because up until recently, we haven't that we haven't be, had that capacity to, to take to take more than four or five, um, the functionality of the platform, but now we have so um, um, I understood why you, why you moved over. Yeah. Yeah, I, and just just to clarify, from a from a naming perspective, now the group platform will hold up to sixty, um, but you can view thirty at a time. So if you want to run really big groups, whether a mass education group, not like the capacity is there for you. But again, it's very much down to what what meets the needs of your client group that you're currently working with. I think that's your start point. But if you if you need to go up to big numbers, you can. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I'm going to just ask Dawn if, if she hasn't already put in the links out to our, all our resources online on our, on our website. The NEMI website has got a, a whole page plus extra links out to support and guidance all about NEMI groups. So um, take a look at that. If there are themes from the chat that we haven't covered, then um, we'll absolutely uh, capture those. Uh, and get those out to you afterwards, along with the, the copy of the slides and also the uh, link to the video as well. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to just put up a QR code, which again is a little post kind of session survey. So again, it's just a temperature check to see what people have gained from today and, and, and asking about what their thoughts are on, on using uh, groups uh, digitally in the future. Um, and I'm just going to check through. Is there anybody else that has any other particular parting comments or things you want to capture 
before we finish, I'm just conscious we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm Tracy just messing me about, about some of the features of the near me platform. So along with your up to 60, you've got breakout rooms now, you've got uh, the chat function, You've also got an ability to, to offer some choice around how visible people's names are. So the default setting is other callers only see their initials, but we realize in some groups that actually seeing other people's names is quite helpful. Um, and that can be switched on and off along with the chat as well, because not everybody wants to have chat in their groups. So there's quite a bit of flexibility now within the platform. Um, uh, so, so that's been, these have all been features that have been worked on and tested out with our Pathfinder sites, uh, amongst which the dietitians have been um, uh, key in kind of informing what the platform needed to look like when it first launched. So um, I'm just thinking anything else. Um, so all I really need to do now is just to really thank everyone that's participated in today. Uh, we've had a really nice breadth of, of experiences and, and outcomes and patient satisfaction and lots of different ways of, of, of thinking about how we interact with patients in groups. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for the, the speakers that participated and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see you again at another one of our webinars. And please do our quick survey and uh, thank you very much again. Goodbye.